decoding BCCI Game of Thrones. Our top focus on Five Live. And there's plenty of politics over the BCCI Game of Thrones. Dada being shunted. Roger Binney all set to be the new Dada after his nomination. What is the reasoning behind this top-level change of guard in the world's richest cricket administrating body? India's very own BCCI. We're going to decode it for you right here on 5 Live. I'm Shiv Arur. These are the headlines. Unimaginable savagery in Kerala occult murders. Women chopped, cooked and eaten, apparently for prosperity. Brought, it, brought in on pretext of sex work, victims chopped into 56 pieces. Allegations of cannibalism as well. Shocker from Karnataka's Chikmaglur. Coffee estate owner locks up and tortures Dalit labourers. Video sparks massive outrage. Huh? Mega India Today exclusive Malikarjun Kharge's big attack on rival Shashi Tharoor in the race for the Congress presidency. Kharge mocks lightweight Tharoor asks, Where was Tharoor when I was the block chief? Says, I am not answerable to Tharoor, he is not my examiner. I don't want to answer Thar Tharoor questions. Uh, he is not my examiner. I have come on my own from block president to this level. Was Sashi Sharur was there at that time was there? Language war reignites southern Satrap slam Hindi imposition decisions. Kumar Swami launches Hindistan attack after Stalin's challenge. Kerala Chief Minister seeks Prime Minister Modi's intervention. Yatra versus Yatra fight escalates in pole-bound Karnataka after BJP's Jan Sankalp Yatra. Congress plans Rath Yatra before the election seven months from now. He's a man who needs no introduction. He's a man famous for the 1983 victory. Former India all-rounder Roger Binney is the man set to replace Saurav Ganguly as the new president of the Board of Control for Cricket in India, the BCCI, the world's richest and most powerful cricket administration body, with Jay Shah keeping his place as the secretary. The presidential chair is about to change, with Dada, Saurav Ganguly, being shunted and Roger Binney tipped to take his place. The nominations for the post of five office bearers of the BCCI have already been filed and Arun Dhumal has bagged the key post of IPL chairman, which is something that Saurav Ganguly had rejected. Here's the full report on this Game of Thrones. The power struggle for the plum BCCI post is now over. The men who will run Indian cricket for the next three years have been selected and the BCCI will now have a new chief in Roger Binney. The former India all-rounder replaces another ex-India cricketer, Saurav Ganguly, who has been completely ignored from the list of office bearers. Jay Shah will continue to remain in his position as the board secretary with BJP politician Ashish Shelar making his debut in the board as its treasurer. While the election process has already been set in motion, the official appointments will be announced on October 18th at the BCCI AGM. Arun Dhumal, brother of INB Minister Anurag Thakur, has been handed the responsibility of the IPL as its new chairman, taking over from Brijesh Patel. Last week, an important meeting was held in the capital with all the key BCCI members present, where the road ahead was discussed and the list of the office bearers was finalised late on Monday night in Mumbai. Rajya Sabha MP Rajiv Shukla has also managed to keep his place as the Vice President, while Devojit Saikia will be the new Joint Secretary. No, I see. So, it will be the 18th of AGM. What will be the representative? What will be the representative? It will be the representative. 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 It will be the representative.
All the office bearers have already filed their nominations and will be elected unopposed to run the office for the next three years. Ganguly perhaps is the only one to be left out, although it is learned that he was keen to continue as the port chief. However, the decision has left him disappointed and the only key position that he can now eye is that of ICC chairman. But the top BCCI and government hierarchy may not rule out a red carpet for him. Sports Bureau, India Today. And like I said, Roger Binney needs no introduction. He's a hero from India's great cricketing past. And here is Roger Binney's ascent to the top for those who need a reminder of this. Remember, he was favoured by the N. Srinivasan camp. He's a former player of repute, World Cup winner, part of that famous 1983 team. He has past experience as selector and administrator. He has a clean image, considered a man of integrity, uncontroversial, not someone you see in the headlines, you know, for reasons right or wrong. A person who is seen to have integrity and could be a kind of refreshing face, as it, as it were, for the presidency of the BCCI. Not that Saurav Ganguly was not, but there is a perception that Roger Binney would be a breath of fresh air at the top of the BCCI. Joining us live is uh, Nikhil Naz, a consulting editor on our sports desk. Uh, Nikhil, what are you making of this nomination in... Roger Binney already being seen as, uh, you know, pretty much confirmed. Why has this happened, first of all, uh, you know, Nikhil? Explain to us why this change was deemed necessary. Well, Shiv, uh, uh, firstly, I mean, this is a very different uh, BCCI to the BCCI uh, that I've covered for close to two decades. Uh, BCCI elections were always as exciting as, uh, you know, sometime national elections as well, because there was a lot of lobbying that would go on uh, days before the elections came. Then, even before the election started, you wouldn't know that who's the one who's going to be elected. You went into the AGM, and only after hours of negotiation and a lot yeah. of voting, you would get to know who's the one who's coming out as a BCCI president. President, this BCCI has seen a sea change. We saw it last time around, and I think at that time, Saurav Ganguly emerged as the consensus candidate only because, remember, of the turmoil that the BCCI went through right mm. before that. You had the committee of administrators, you had the constitution completely revamped, and from there on, I think there was this sort of an understanding within the BCCI that you really need to fix the image of the BCCI. So right. one of the things that they've done is to ensure that you have a player as the BCCI president. Remember last time around as well, Saurav Ganguly's name wasn't doing the run. In fact, it was only at the 11th hour that it was decided that it's best to go with someone like a Saurav Ganguly, a former captain who is also heading the Cricket Association of Bengal as the chief. And I think something similar has happened this time around. As you mentioned, Roger Binney, a man of integrity, uh, he's a, a cricketer of repute, and all of these things went into deciding that let's uh, Roger Binney be the guy. But you mustn't forget that at the end of the day, it is going to be those 30 votes that decide who's going to be the candidate. And this time, why you're not going to have any elections? Because he's going to be unanimous, because he had the backing of a very powerful group of, uh, of, of BCCI that is uh, de facto headed by a former president, Nen Srinivasan. Yeah. He roughly controls about 14 votes, and that's going to be very, very crucial. This last time around, they had agreed on Saurav Ganguly's name, though I know that that camp wasn't very happy with Saurav's name. This time around, the other camp has conceded that, okay, let it be your candidate. And from there on, uh, Roger Binney has emerged as the consensus candidate. Where, where did things begin to unravel in your view, uh, Nikhil, as far as Saurav was concerned? I mean, w why did it need to happen and come to this point? Uh, a few things that have gone into that, uh, uh, Shiv. Firstly, uh, there was this uh, criticism. Now, we remember there was a meeting here in Delhi uh, with a lot of very influential people, a lot of them who are going to be voters in the BCCI election. And at that time, a former BCCI president in N. Srinivasan is set to have criticized the three years regime of Saurav Ganguly. There were a few areas that were pointed out. One, it was said that, uh, uh, remember, he is also uh, endorsing a lot of brands that are uh, at 
at the moment rival brands to the BCCI. So, for example, if BCCI has got a set of sponsors because Saurav Ganguly himself endorses a lot of brand because of the fact that he's been a former player, some of those are rival brand and that doesn't go down very well. Then there were conflict of interest charges. There were a few uh, people within the BCCI, as I said, that faction led by N. Srinivasan that said that, listen, we are not happy with the time that he spent as BCCI president. Also, the other thing that was pointed out, that it's unprecedented, it's very uh, rare do you have in BCCI that one person continues for two back-to-back -back terms. And so since Saurav has done this one term, it's best to look for another candidate. I think uh, sometime there are these uh, sort of compromises that are made, that you go in with one faction for one position and the other faction for the other position. And that's the internal politics that's actually played out here. And that is why they thought that it's best not to go with Saurav Ganguly. However, to please Saurav, there was an offer made that why doesn't he then become uh, the chairman of the IPL? But yeah. Saurav at that time is said to have said that, no, you know, I've already been BCCI president. I want to continue. Saurav made that very clear. He wanted to continue. But if you're going to make me a head of a subcommittee, that mm. would be a step down from being a BCCI president. He refused that. And that's why that position has gone to Arun Dhumal. Arun Dhumal is the new IPL chairman. Nikhil, thanks very much for that. So lots of internal politics brewing within the BCCI. Uh, every bit as exciting as a national election, as uh, Nikhil says, and he's been covering that for nearly two decades now. Well, there's a lot of external politics brewing around this entire issue as well. Remember, Saurav Ganguly belongs to Bengal, and Bengal politics has also entered the entire BCCI arena. Saurav Ganguly's exit as the BCCI president has triggered a war of words between West Bengal's ruling Trinamool, that makes Bengali identity its calling card, and the main opposition, the BJP. While the Trinamool has linked Ganguly's exit from the BCCI to his refusal to join the BJP last year before the Bengal elections, the Saffron Party, however, has dubbed the allegations as baseless, saying that they've never tried to induct the Prince of Kolkata, as Ganguly is fondly called by his supporters, into its fold. But where do things lie? Remember, there's never smoke without a fire, and there's no black and white here. Lots of politics. Check this out. Amid reports predicting end of Dada Giri in BCCI and 1983 World Cup hero Roger Binney taking over from Saurav Ganguly, a massive political khela has erupted between TMC and BJP. BJP stalwarts, including Home Minister Amit Shah, had met Ganguly and lavished praises on him during the 2021 Bengal polls, leading to speculations of Dada joining the Saffron Party. जब सौरव गांगुली गांगुली क्रीज क्रीज को पार कर जाते थे तब लोग यह मान लेते थे कि हमारा सौरव गांगुली जो है छक्का मारेगा शिक्षक मारेगा तो सौरव गांगुली शिक्षक मार देते थे वाल द क्लेम्स केम टू अ नॉट नाउ द टीएमसी क्लेम्स गांगुली इज बीइंग आउटस्टेड फ्रॉम द बीसीसीआई फॉर डिक्लाइनिंग द ऑफर टू जॉइन बीजेपी एंड टेक ऑन ममता बनर्जी बिकॉज़ ही हैजंट जॉइन बीजेपी एंड एज ही बिलोंग्स टू द स्टेट ऑफ Mamta Banerjee, he belongs to the state of West Bengal ruled by Trinamool Congress. And as because he hasn't given his consent to join BJP, probably he has become a prey to this political vendetta. Agar BJP ki ka intention aisa hai, it's absolutely malafide. Agar humara saath do, ne to tumko nikal diya jayega. The BJP mocked TMC claims, saying Amit Shah had never asked Ganguly to join the BJP. Mamata Banerjee ka parivar ke log sab jagah Chaudhary banke baithe hain, chairman hai, director hai. Jo kabi ludo aur taas chhodke kuch nahi khela hai, wo aaj Olympic Association ka chairman hai. Samajh sakte hain? Jo log kabi Saurav ke liye ek awaj nahi uthaya, wo log aaj Saurav ke liye pani aansu bahar rahe hain. Kyu? तो टेनू पूरा हो गया दूसरा कोई जिम्मेदारी लगे तो होता है सब जगह उसमें इतनी सारी राजनीति की क्या जरूरत है बांग्लार दादा सौरभ गांगुली जथेष्ट नहीं बांगाली हिसाब से गर्वित आज के दिन एक जैगे बीस छें कल के बड़ो पदे जानार जो अल देश बोल एखे राजनीति नए बीजेपी कख यब नहीं राजनीति करना और जरा परिवार तंत्र नहीं कथा बोलते निजे मुख्य एक बार आयन देखुक रिपोर्ट्स क्लेम दैट बीसीसीआई इज अनलाइकली टू बैक दादा फॉर अ जॉब एट आईसीसी टू जय शाह द सेक्रेटरी ऑफ द बोर्ड एंड सन ऑफ यूनियन होम मिनिस्टर अमित शाह हाउ एवर हैज रिपोर्टेडली बीन रिटेन्ड एज बीसीसीआई सेक्रेटरी 
Is the former cricket captain the latest flashpoint in the great Bengal political khela? Bureau report, India Today. Now, why has Saurav Ganguly's innings ended? Lots of politics taking place within Bengal. But remember, there are politics within the BCCI and outside. He's been criticized, for starters, for non-performance. Two full terms back-to-back -back seen as unprecedented for the position of BCCI president. Saurav Ganguly has been criticized for endorsing rival brands of BCCI's principal sponsors. That did not go down well with the powers that be. Former BCCI... Uh, President N. Srinivasan Camp has been critical of Saurav Ganguly and as Nikhil just told us, the N. Srinivasan Camp controls, you know, roughly 14 of the 30 votes that go into choosing who becomes the next president of the BCCI. But the entire Prince of Calcutta, you know, who was shunted by the government at the centre because uh, Saurav Ganguly refused to join the BJP in 2021 before the Bengal elections is being seen as a political flashpoint. And that's what the Trinamool is alleging. Suryagni Roy joins me live from Kolkata. Suryagni, Saurav Ganguly, cricket, BCCI, all very explosive topics. And this time, the Trinamool pointing a finger directly at the BJP and saying, you are getting rid of Dada because he refused to toe your line and join your party before the elections. And this is against... Bengali culture also. So this has become a Trinamool BJP fight also, Suryagni. Well, absolutely, Shiv. As you rightly pointed out, the external politics is, you know, it's as interesting as the internal politics in BCCI. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, taking a cue from uh, your question, this is what the B this is what the Trinamool has been, you know, uh, stating since yesterday. Their main uh, claim is that, uh, you know, we all were witness to the fact that Amit Shah and uh, 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 an array of senior BJP leadership did visit Saurav Ganguly's residence. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Amit Shah even checked on his health when he was hospitalized in uh, January 2021 uh, and uh, it, it, it was an open secret that the that the BJP was looking for a very prominent face from West Bengal. However, the BJP uh, on record, they have never accepted that it was uh, Saurav Ganguly and coming back from uh, coming back to Saurav, Saurav never, you know, accepted that he got an offer of uh, that, kind, uh, that kind of a sort. But today, you know, since yesterday, Trinomul has been hitting it hard against the BJP stating that back in 2021 when the elections were around the corner the bjp wanted uh, you know to rope in saurav ganguly and to you know portray the dharti putra uh, uh, you know uh, angle and uh, that is when he had turned it down and this is the repercussion of that turning down this is what the, B the trinamool is claiming not one leader but various leaders today you know we spoke to madan mitra he's uh, he's known to be very close to saurav ganguly he was the former uh, you know sports minister of west bengal he made a comparison between uh, mithun and saurav ganguly both Big time, you know, big ticket icons from West Bengal, and uh, there's a lot of emotions associated with both Mithun and uh, with uh, with Ganguly as well. Now, what he said, you know, uh, clearly he indicated that what Mithun could do for BJP, uh, uh, Saurav could not, and that is the reason why, uh, you know, uh, uh, Saurav was asked to leave. So this is what the you know, uh, the, the Trinamool Congress is claiming from uh, yesterday. Hmm. However, when it comes to the BJP, uh, the BJP is slamming the Trinamool as hard as the Trinamool is slamming them. They are stating that, uh, you know, there are bodies, there are sports yeah. bodies which are controlled by Mamta's own kin, Mamta's own brother. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, there are various sports people who have left the state because of a lack of infrastructure over here. So this is what the BJP is hitting at. And uh, the political fist fight has just begun. And we are still waiting for a reaction okay. from Saurav Ganguly himself. However, he's been quiet as of yet. Back to you, a, I, I doubt that he's going to be anything but tight-lipped on such an important issue, especially when he stands to lose power at this point of time. I don't think there's you know, any going back from this. It looks like the dice is loaded against Saurav Ganguly and Roger Binney is all tipped to be the next Dada, as it were, of the BCCI. Thanks very much, Suryagni, for joining us on that big story. We'll keep you posted. Uh, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion, but...
anything can happen this way or that, but Roger Benny seemed to be favoured by the powers that be within the BCCI, including the N. Srinivasan camp. So it looks like the world's most powerful, richest and most influential cricket administrating body, the BCCI, is all set to have a brand new president, hero of 1983, Roger Binney. You heard it first here on India Today. Quick break here on Five Live. Coming up on the other side, shocking images from a remote island off the coast of New Zealand. 500 pilot whales die in a mass stranding in the South Pacific. Images that have shocked environmentalists across the world. But why has this happened? And why does it keep happening every single year, including here in India? What's driving these whales to their deaths? I explore that on the other side. Everyone's busy finding what's trending. You're busy finding out why. India Today, for those who research before reacting. Download the India Today app now. Our world is filled with many scenic, interesting, weird and some creepy places. And we'll tell you about five weird islands of the world. This island is in Mexico. The island is surrounded with many dolls across it and the story begins 50 years ago when only one man used to live there. One night he found a dead girl in the lake along with a doll so he hung a doll on the tree in memory of her. This is where things got out of hand. He started having many nightmares and so he hung more dolls around the island. He died in 2001 but the island is visited by tourists quite often. On the island of Socotra, you find trees and plants that are nowhere. Up to a third of this island is endemic. This island is isolated and it's also called as the most island-looking place on Earth. In 2008, this was declared as UNESCO's World Heritage Site. It lies in the Arabian Peninsula but is considered to be a part of Africa. So when do you plan to visit this place? Off the coast of Dubai are 300 man-made islands. This was made to look like the world. It took $13 billion to build these islands. It was constructed using tons of sand from the Persian Sea. People can buy part of the island and name it even. Its construction was started in 2003 and was completed in 2008. But due to the financial crisis of 2008, these islands weren't bought by many. Now it's just abandoned pieces of land. Is this the cutest island or what? The island is filled with rabbits all around. This place is known as Okushima Island. But let's tell you that behind this cuteness, there's also a dark past. During World War II, this island was built to develop poisonous gas to attack China. Due to the poisonous gases, more than 80,000 soldiers of China died. This island was a secret and Japan even removed it from the map at that time. Now, this island only has a museum here with many of these cute creatures. It's said that these rabbits were left here by school and then multiplied into a bunch of them. You know Maldives is a beautiful fancy island, but beyond that lies a waste island. It was built to get rid of the waste that was covering the island and every day around 700 tons of waste was generated. When it was burnt, it would pollute the island and affect tourists. To solve this issue, they made this island. But many believe that it needs to get rid of this waste that's polluting the clean water. These are the five weirdest islands that we found on Earth. Do you know about any others? Let us know in the comments. Everyone's busy finding what's trending. You're busy finding out why. India Today, for those who research before reacting. Download the India Today app now.
Tonight at 9 p.m. on the news today with me, Rajdeep Sardesai. Saurav Ganguly, out of the race to become the next BCCI president, has sparked off a political war. The Trinamool Congress claims that this is a conspiracy against Bengal because Ganguly refused to toe the line of the BJP. What's the real story behind Ganguly out of the BCCI? That's going to be a big talking point on the news today. Also, our big newsmaker tonight, the man who's front-runner to become the next Congress president, Malikarjun Karge, will be joining us. Will he be remote controlled by the Gandhi family? We'll ask him that and much more on the news today. La sobriété et la solidarité européenne nous permettront d'éviter des coupures et des rationnements dans les cas de figure les plus pessimistes, comme un hiver particulièrement froid cumulé à des difficultés d'approvisionnement. Ces scénarios nous incitent à poursuivre notre stratégie, une sobriété choisie plutôt que des coupures subies, une solidarité européenne pour mieux résister à l'hiver. Greenhouse gas emissions are a looming threat to climate change. Industries are finding ways to capture and store carbon. This helps in reducing the emissions and reducing the overall impact of carbon on the environment. Carbon capture and storage is a way of reducing industrial greenhouse gas emissions. It involves recovering the carbon gas at its source and holding it in underground reserves. First, the carbon dioxide is separated from the smoke or combustion fumes. Industrial emissions comprise up to 15% carbon dioxide. The rest is mainly water vapor and nitrogen. Separating the gases is costly, accounting for about two-thirds of the overall capture and storage process. Capture techniques are constantly evolving. Extracting the carbon dioxide post-combustion is a well-mastered method, but it's relatively energy intensive. Another possibility is removing the carbon dioxide before the fuel is burnt. Development of this process is ongoing. Once separated, the carbon dioxide is compressed and transported by pipeline, boat or tanker to underground or deep sea storage facilities. It is injected far underneath gas tight layers of rock and stored under pressure until it reaches a near liquid state. Suitable storage sites include end of life oil and gas fields or extremely deep layers of porous rock impregnated with salt water. SMS is designed to create panic, digital fraud, sextortion, web of cybercrime unravels. 
Are you and your money safe? The Jamtara Files, an India Today investigation at 8 p.m. It's a story and images that have shocked people, me certainly, and others all across the world. Just look at these images for a moment, viewer. It's one of the most horrific mass death events involving marine mammals. The animals you see on your screen are pilot whales. Over 500 of them have died after beaching, getting stranded on a pair of remote islands off the coast of New Zealand in the South Pacific over the last two days. While some of the whales were likely saved by locals, there was such an enormous number of these pilot whales that it was always going to be totally unmanageable, unthinkable to save each and every one of them. Also, with these waters being shark infested, humans trying to rescue whales run the risk of being attacked and therefore there are restrictions on that as well. But these images of hundreds upon hundreds of whales getting stranded, struggling to get back into the ocean and then dying because of dehydration, collapsing under their own weight, drowning in shallow water as well, is something that has horrified, disturbed and unsettled not just environmentalists, but people all across the world. Why are these beautiful, gentle creatures dying in such large numbers? Did you know that such cetacean strandings, as they're called, have been happening for centuries together from the time of recorded history? And yet, even now, with all our advancements in science, environmentalists, ecologists still don't fully agree on why these incidents take place? Why do whales go in such large numbers to die on remote beaches? Let's give you a sense of what the possible reasons are, some of the possible theories that scientists have been looking at over the decades and the centuries. One, whales, remember, have very strong social bonding. If one whale is stuck, others will follow, and this could possibly lead to a mass stranding. Number two, Whale, remember, they communicate and they also navigate using echolocation, using echoes and sound waves. Sometimes echolocation fails to pick up the decreased depth and the gently sloping continental shelves near the shore. And that's why they get stranded. These are not small animals, remember. Third theory, disruptions in Earth's magnetic field is also a possible theory that's been explored over the years. Could there be a possible link to active military sonar used by navies, used nearby. There are studies that have made a direct link between sonar and stranding incidents uh, in different parts of the world. And finally, could it be linked to climate change, shifting ocean temperatures between cool and warm, between squid and other food of these whales moving to areas with shallower waters and the whales have to move towards them and then they get stranded in places that they are not really familiar with. These are some of the theories that scientists have been looking at for ages together. And remember, what you're seeing in New Zealand today is not something that's happening just far away from home. Right here in India, as you can see in these images from Tamil Nadu in 2016, 81 similar whales, also pilot whales, happened to get stranded on the Tanjavur coast of Tamil Nadu and died in a very similar manner. Similar circumstances, same large number, similar response by locals, but 81 had died in Tamil Nadu. This time, 500 have died in New Zealand. And scientists have lots of theories like I just showed you, but there is still no full agreement on how or why this actually takes place. It's been happening for so long. Take a look at some of the biggest stranding incidents that have taken place. But first, India's own whale hotspots. In India, for instance, there are three major whale stranding hotspots where year upon year, there are incidents of whales getting stranded. The coast of Tamil Nadu, the coast of West Bengal, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are three locations in India where 
whale mass strandings have been recorded or have taken place. And this is where ecologists are always on the ready to try and rescue these whales, push them back. But we still don't know precisely why this has been taking place. Take a look at some of the biggest mass strandings of whales that have taken place over the years. Just a few weeks ago in Australia, 230 pilot whales got stranded and many of them died in neighboring Australia, just very, very close to New Zealand. Same year, 250 false killer whales passed away after getting stranded on an island in New Zealand. Please notice how many of these things are happening in one region of the world. In 2020, one of the largest mass whale strandings, 470 pilot whales lost their lives after being stranded on a beach in Australia. In 2016, 81 pilot whales uh, died on the coast of Tamil Nadu, those pictures I just showed you. And just to show you how far back all of this kind of thing has been happening, in 1897, 500 pilot whales died after being stranded on the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic, off the coast of Argentina. So whale beaching, strandings, these mass death incidents have been happening for centuries together, and still there is no clear-cut explanation. There are a variety of theories, but no clear-cut explanation for why these beautiful marine mammals continue to beach in such large numbers and then die. I want to bring in onto our coverage uh, this evening Bharti Chaturvedi. She's a well-known environmentalist. She's also founder and director of uh, Chintan Environment Research and Action Group. Bharti, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you know, on this on this important story, I know you uh, you know you you track such things very very closely and you care very deeply for the environment. You know, these pictures rarely make headlines, don't they? I mean, it's only when the visual is so arresting, so disturbing that it actually comes out into the media and I have to say that I felt very compelled to try and tell this story because here you've got a situation where 500 pilot whales you know get stranded on just one or two beaches very close together on a remote island you know th there's no pollution there of any kind there's no human activity there they just beach over there and they all die Bharti many different theories have been put forward by ecologists over the years what is your understanding of this? So I have, um, I always hesitate to give an understanding, uh, just like I initially hesitated when hundreds of migratory birds died yeah. in Rajasthan Sambar Lake. I like to, I like to do, do two things. I like to wait for the specific incident, and there's a reason why. The reason is that we have, we're living in a very, very disrupted, disturbed, uh, tragic era. So scientists often are able to pinpoint things after they happen. And I like to hear from the top scientists working on it rather than, you know, jumping in. For example, we found that in the Sambar uh, Lake tragedy, basically illegal salt mining was electro electrocuting the birds. There was no virus. But similarly, uh, let's wait for the science here. What I do want to say is that this is the most visible part of a much larger tragedy of the death of our oceans. The death of our oceans basically mean the end of us. And yeah. I think we take it really seriously. This is a huge tragedy, and that's why we've noticed it. But you know, if you look at other places that you wouldn't even imagine, for example, the, the Pacific Oceans near Canada, where certain kinds, specific kinds of orca whales are starving. They've been found to starve to death, and for what? because they only eat Chinook uh, salmon, but the Chinook salmon is dying out um, due to various factors, possibly also climate change. So uh, we're seeing absolutely starved whales there. Hmm. I think that those are the kinds of symptoms that are telling us that the largest and the most spectacular life is dying and it should worry because, uh, I mean, we could be next, of course. Very true. And, you know, one of the one of the confusing things, you know, you're right, the, you know, the death of our oceans is, you know, in my view as well, and I hate jumping to conclusions as well, just like you, Bharti, uh, you know, appears to be, uh, you know, uh, at least one of the chief, uh, you know, causative things, you know, when you see something like this. What is confusing and perplexing, Bharti, is that these mass beachings of whales have been, apparently, I was just doing some reading before this show, they've been taking place for centuries together. 
apparently, you know, even in the, in the 19th century, in the 18th century, there are recorded versions of such, you know, mass strandings of whales. Uh, uh, of course, you know, of course, you know, a human, a human impact on the oceans is not something new. It's been happening for a very, very long time. But, you know, one is wondering whether you know, there is more to this. And you're right when you say that, you know, we should wait for scientists to look at the, the specific instances of each instance. But, you know, there is so much similarity to all these strandings, like the one that happened in Tamil Nadu, the one that happened in Australia a few weeks ago, and this one. And, you know, what we should, what we should uh, keep in mind is that there's one thing like you and I are talking about waiting for the verdict of science. Yeah. But there's a about joining the big do the dots and looking at the big picture and i think for example uh, there might be one case here and a reason here and a very different one say with the chinook salmon and the starvation and some third case what we need to really remember what we need to note and i mean i think what we what we should really recall is the oceans themselves are changing right now these oceans are no longer the oceans of 100 years ago because they used to be carbon sinks but now they're warming up corals are bleaching microplastics are killing them all of this is happening and those oceans are turning into into chemical heated chemical soups so we need to know and we need to ask those questions and that is something that we who are not actually scientists looking at this particular incident should be able to red flag that these are serious things happening and they might have a role or they might have helped precipitate something like this. Because yeah. even a small change in the ecosystem, these are niche animals, you know, even a small um, uh, change in the ecosystem can completely devastate their ability to, for example, navigate. Now, yeah. when such large, uh, creatures are stranded you would the first thing i would say is that they're obviously going somewhere together uh, and that one place they might have been going and this is a guess um, and it's purely a conjecture is perhaps they were migrating we know whales migrate in the oceans and so maybe they were migrating this is perfectly a valid season to do that so perhaps something went wrong perhaps their sonar systems got disrupted we don't yeah. understand that that could be jolly well one reason and now you can't rescue them because there's so many sharks around so um that could jolly well be a disruption of migration which is something that is not only happening in the seas but it's also happening in the skies with our yeah. overlit cities looking at millions of birds and uh, you know uh, cma and all kinds of other organizations have been talking about it millions of birds just getting completely disoriented from light now, for once, there's light in the in the air, but there could be other things in the oceans. And we need to remove uh, remove and let our oceans be alone and kind of try to nurture them back as fast as possible. Human action, the changing climate, climate change, the oceans, all of these are factors and we still don't have a specific answer. Let's hope we learn more. 500 of these beautiful creatures have died. Let's hope we can understand more about uh, this kind of thing, because there will be more. That's the one thing we can all be sure of. Bharti Chaturvedi, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for helping us understand these very distressing images from our natural world. Beautiful pilot whales, 500 of them, their corpses covering an entire remote beach in the South Pacific. Images that have shocked me, shocked our viewers, shocked people all across the world. We'll keep a track of that story and try and get you more about that. That's it on Five Live. Thanks so much for watching. Coming up next, this is a story that has truly, truly terrified and horrified people across the country. Sensational human sacrifice, cannibalism and the occult in Kerala. Akshita brings you that story on 6pm Prime. Ghost malls. Well, India is dealing with a strange problem known as ghost malls, which is prevalent not only in Delhi and CR, but in other cities like Pune and Hyderabad. So what is this problem and why is India dealing with it? 
If a mall has a vacancy of more than 40%, it's defined as a ghost mall. As the COVID pandemic subsides, Indian malls are seeing an increase in the number of visitors. Some malls, however, have remained empty, with no shops and therefore no crowds. According to Knight Frank, India's latest report, Think India, Think Retail 2022, 57 malls or 21% of all malls in India's top eight cities are in disrepair and has resulted in a loss of over $524 million. According to the report, India's physical stores still account for 95% of retail business. Excluding the ghost malls, the overall mall health has improved post-pandemic. Earlier, there were 255 malls in 2018, which has now increased to 271, adding over 15 million square feet. This is happening despite the rise of e-commerce. So where is the issue and why does India have so many ghost malls? Well, there are multiple factors behind the stocks of ghost malls in the country. It includes lack of due diligence, mall shortcomings such as size and ownership patterns, design issues, faulty layout with dark alleys, lack of customer workflow management, low occupancy and lack of anchor tenants. So what is the solution for this? It's crucial that such malls, despite being unfit for the purpose for which they were built, be reopened as a large amount of capital is trapped in these assets. Here are some solutions the report suggested. To lease out empty spaces. Local businesses that cannot afford high rents in prime office business parks or popular business districts can rent out empty spaces for long-term commercial use. Warehousing. Warehousing can also be considered in such malls as large floor plates with vacant spaces are available. Short-term leasing for temporary occupancy such as community events, birthday parties, cultural shows during festival periods and corporate events, rebranding them as entertainment and play hubs. Converting these locations into community spaces and rebranding them as... SMS is designed to create panic. Digital fraud, sextortion, web of cybercrime unravels. Are you and your money safe? The Jam Tara Files, an India Today investigation at 8 p.m. Justice, liberty, equality. The pillars that built India, a nation where everyone has dignity and opportunities to prosper. But today, over 75 years after independence, Dalits remain a community trapped for centuries by the caste system, languishing in a dismal state. Nearly 20% of India's population is Dalit. Dalits still live in abject poverty, excluded on the margins, facing atrocities, toxic untouchability, and no opportunities for economic upliftment. The father of India's constitution, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, fought all his life for the upliftment of Dalits. In the past, many state and central governments have made big promises, but It has been nothing more than lip service. Basic human rights have still not been delivered. Dalits remain downtrodden and discriminated against. This shocking reality is a national shame. Few have dared to break the cage of caste discrimination until now. Friend to the downtrodden, upholding human rights and dignity, Championing a Baker's India, KCR is showing India and the world how a revolution is sparked in Telangana through his path breaking scheme, Telangana Dalit Bandhu. Approximately 17,50,000 Dalit families call Telangana home, and now they are calling Telangana the land of opportunity. Thanks to Dalit Bandhu, launched in 2021 by the TRS government, a world-first scheme which will give each Dalit family an astounding financial boost of 10 lakh rupees. There are many more schemes along with this which are under implementation all over the state. But Dalit Bandhu 
is a specially designed program for the upliftment of the Dalit community. It has an unprecedented objective to uplift 17,50,000 Dalit households with a one-time capital grant of 10 lakh rupees per household, 100% subsidy with zero repayment, delivered via direct to beneficiary transfer, with a dedicated Dalit Bandhu scheme help desk and monitoring committee at village, mandal, district and state level, and a 10% reservation for Dalits in profit generating schemes, government contracts and licenses. In addition to this, Telangana has another visionary program for Dalit students, residential schools and colleges, and Ambedkar Overseas Vidya Nidhi, a 20 lakh rupees overseas scholarship, giving them the most powerful tool for success, education. Huzurabad, 2021. The Telangana Dalit Bandhu pilot was launched. Telangana's Dalit Bandhu is a path-breaking scheme that places absolute trust in the beneficiary. Each household has complete freedom and flexibility to decide its business and how to grow their dreams. I am a pharmacy, sir. Then, after that, I was a pharmacist in a lot of places. Now, I am going to go to the Telangana government. I am going to start my own business. I am going to go to the TRS government. I am going to go to the TRS government. Dalabandu skema kodi peti mana orang na orang ni no setel gawat ane kiri oka opportunity create jisun sir. Households were identified as beneficiaries and the direct benefit transfer of 10 lakh rupees was made. Each family unit was free to decide how they wished to invest this 100% subsidy. It could be a single or multiple businesses. Multiple beneficiaries could pool their resources to build a bigger business. It could be in any sector of their choice. The sky was the limit. In no time, the stories of transformation began rolling in. These are just a small fraction of the 40,000 success stories that Telangana has empowered through the Dalit Bandhu scheme. In just one year, it has smashed records for any Dalit upliftment scheme in the country. Till date, the Dalit Bandhu scheme has been implemented in all 119 assembly constituencies in Telangana. Beneficiaries have achieved prosperity for their families. They have also created opportunity for their community by providing employment and revenue. The resounding success of the Dalit Bandhu scheme has energized the TRS government to accelerate its efforts. From 40,000 beneficiaries with an outlay of 4,441.8 crore rupees, now Telangana government has raised the Dalit Bandhu budget to reach about 2 lakh beneficiaries with an outlay of 17,700 crore rupees, making this the world's largest direct benefit scheme. Delta Bandhu achin tarawata i padi lakshya lani di mamul ka andar ki opportunity raadu. Di di purti government wal magu padi lakshya li chesi. Me istem na maya parane petko anje pesi anna ram anna ram wal magu inta adi ka puro gati kali. Di anda ya kunna me mu inta mandu oka dagera worker ka panje se wala puro owner ka unda galu tu nam. Never before has such a revolutionary scheme been designed to end caste discrimination. Where Dalits receive 100% opportunity along with 100% dignity. Dalita bandh padakam raakam undu. Me maite chala struggles face jaisam. Dalita bandh padakam kinda me me embroidery machine enchu kone pet kunam. Net kuna workune ni no fulfill ei alan kone. Ye embroidery start jaisam sir. Ichna andu ko chala chala dhaniya vadal ke ese ar gari ki Telangana prabudhan gora me mento rona padi unnamu. Mukuranga soka unit beta ma ante 30 lakhs beti. Oka vehicle itu, buat American tourist shop betam. Bahan yang arsan di perai deh. Dan yang job je sebab ni, buat owner ga, ada oka company owner ga, buat feel out tu na. Chala happy ga undi. Jiwa na pati ga, mission itu pun tu berarti kan sir, main mak mukur feel lelo. Walan jadi picu pun tu main berarti kalau ni chala custom aja tu sir. Upur delta bandu dawara KCR ga rum lad pun nasi sir walau. Udara ngal si betu pun nam sir, mission ni koyam batu no celi, tepi picu pun nam sir mission no. Nan woman, woman bag sesar memu. Makun 